week 13, uh, counting it right on down. Um, we just got through doing a lot of the a lot of the verses last week in Job. This should finish up Job. I, I, I can almost promise you this session will finish up Job. There again, I make no apologies. Uh, I know that mainly we have read verses, and as we go on to the next people, we probably will not read so many verses. The main purpose that I had you to go along with me to read the verses is so that we can go verse by verse and let you be able to start learning how to pick out what people's emotions are. As we study people's lives in the Bible, we tend to forget sometime that this is not a storybook. This is not make-believe people. These are people that have went through actual events, and the stories that's written there are factual, and these people uh, had some emotions that was involved in it. Uh, most of the time, they had multiple people that had uh, multiple emotions in the same event. And so, therefore, while we're going through this as far as the book of Job, I wanted to make sure that we spent a lot of time there. There again, we're going to uh, reemphasize that God must have thought this to be very important uh, because he put, devoted so many chapters into this one man and his experience and what all he was feeling. Uh, I believe that God wants us to learn about man and their emotions, uh, or mankind, I should say, to be politically correct, or maybe even gender kind. I'm, I'm not even going there. It's either mankind or just man. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I believe that God wanted us to understand their emotions and, and understand that, that people do have emotions. And, and I'm so glad that, that, uh, that he wrote this before Jesus Christ came, because when we look at Christ's life, we see tons of emotions in him too. Uh, him being God in flesh, of course. He's taken on flesh, and he was able to experience the emotions that he had created for man to be able to have. And so, uh, like I said, I'm not sorry that we took verse by verse. The main reason, again, was so that you can begin to learn uh, how to decipher that, to be able to see it for your own self, uh, to take those verses and not just take my interpretation of it, but allowing you to be able to see it yourself and try to pick it out yourself. I hope that you did what I asked you to do last week and go back over not only what Job responded, but also what these friends of his I had said and try to pick out the emotions and why Job responded the way he did. Uh, every response that comes from someone has come from somewhere else. They don't just speak something out of their mind and it not reflects something that they had gone through. And so I hope you took out the time to do that. There's no way I can find out for sure, but I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you didn't. If you didn't, I asked you again, since we have no homework assignment, uh, I ask you again to go back over and look at it. Uh, please don't just bypass this. I hope that you're taking the time, uh, each and every class, to go back over what we have went over and see if you can pick out new things that wasn't mentioned and take notes on it so that you can have this uh, when you begin to pastor or preach or when you begin to counsel. It's good to have, like I said, an uh, arsenal of, of different information. And we're going to try to give you some of that a little bit later on. Uh, matter of fact, in this class, I will be. I'm going to warn you up front. I'm going to be probably starting to cover some things. And I'm going to tell you up front that you need to write it down. When I say you might want to write this down, uh, we're going to take our time. So I want you to have a pencil and paper or a pen and paper or your laptop or whatever you use to write those notes. And uh, I want you to take out the time to write down uh, these things that I'll be saying toward the end of this class. Uh, so, like I said, we're going to be back in Job again. We're going to finish up our little portion here. We're not going to get into the part of what God said and how God's emotion might have been involved in that. Uh, we're not going to get into the part where God eventually restored Job and gave him much more than he ever had. Uh, and what Job emotions may have been in than that. Right now we're covering an area in Job's life uh, to where he had a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, questioning that was going on, did not understand what God was doing. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what we're mainly covering this time, so we will not be going into the rest of that. And uh, we'll probably go ahead and get into Elijah a little bit tonight as well. And uh, we'll see where Elijah had some depression uh, these two are not the only ones that recorded in the Bible that had a type of depression. Uh, we cannot exhaust it 
course, uh, there's tons of uh, people that's in the Bible, and every one of them had forms of emotions. So after this class, it would be good for you to do a study. And, and, and it'll take you a while, but just go around. And, and as you read the Bible, hopefully you're reading the Bible through in a year, maybe. Uh, if not, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big advocate of reading it all the way through at one time. I don't think that's your main goal. I think your main goal would be better to read it and meditate on it. But if you do read it all the way through, then maybe while you're reading it through or while you're meditating on it and you come across characters, uh, then I would suggest that you begin starting now uh, in your studies to begin to not only see what the words are saying, uh, what the scripture or text is talking about, but also try to figure out the human standpoint of what was in the word of God and the emotions that came through that. And so I would hope that you would do that since we're having a class on this. I think it's a very important subject. I think if you do that, I think you'll get a greater understanding of what that passage is talking about and a greater powerful impact on your own life as well as others when you share it uh, by being able to show that side of it. Now, there'll be times, of course, you won't be able to show it at all. But uh, majority of the time, you can pull it out, and it will do the people good. It will do you good to go through that. But as usual, uh, before we get started with uh, week uh, lesson 13, uh, then I want to go ahead and open up a word of prayer. I hope you have your Bibles out. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're going to, again, uh, read them out, probably be slow, let you kind of figure these out as we end this part of Job. Uh, we're going to continue to do like we did last week. So we're going to be in Job chapter 31. So I hope you have your Bible and have it ready to Job chapter 31, because after prayer, uh, we'll be going ahead and get started in that. Uh, thank you, Father Lord, for, uh, for allowing us to come into your throne again. God, I thank you that you've protected us all through our lives up to this point. God, I thank you that we have callings on our life, and I don't know what these men and women's calling may be, but you do. And there's a purpose. Our steps are ordered and led by you. So there's a purpose of this class that they're looking at. There's a purpose for me to be able to teach this class and glean from it. So God, I just pray that what's said and done tonight or, or in this lesson, God, I pray that it will affect them in one way or another, Lord, that will help their ministry to grow and be able to be beneficial to them. God, let your Holy Spirit speak to us as we do this class uh, today in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Like I said, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to Gen uh, Job uh, chapter 31. And I know that we had read the first verse uh, uh, last week, but we're going to go ahead and read it again. And he said, he, he's trying to show that he wasn't everything these men were saying. You remember they were trying to say he was this bad sinner, that he cared nothing for the poor, never did anything for the poor, only looked after himself. And uh, right now, uh, there's, there's, he swaps between different types of emotions. Some he's depressed and in anguish, and then other times he's trying to justify himself because he feels like that he's been attacked. So uh, I'm sure there's frustration there and, and different types of emotions on that. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and start with that verse 1 again. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. He made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon my maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I had walked with vanity, or if my foot hath hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. If my step hath turned out of the way, and my heart walk after mine eyes. And if any blot have cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. If my heart have been deceived, 
by a woman, or if I laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. Let me get rid of this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I always forget to lock that chair back. I'm sure that looks hilarious. But uh, let me lock this back down. For this is the heinous crime. Yea, it is iniquity to be punished by the judges. For it is a fire that consumeth the destruction and would root out all my increases. Are you hearing what he's saying? Seems like he understands it. He wasn't guilty of all this. He said, if I did despise the cause of my manservant, or if my maidservant, when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God riseth up? And when he visiteth, what shall I answer him? Did not he that made me in the womb make me? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If I had withheld the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, and I believe that was one of the statements that one of them made, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless hath not eaten thereof. For from my youth he was brought up with me, as with a father. And I have guided her from my mother's womb. If I had seen any perish for want of clothing, or any poor without covering. If his loins have not blessed me, and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep. If I had lifted up my hand against the fatherless, when I saw my help in the gate. He said, then let my arm fall from my shoulder blade. I don't know about you, but I've had that happen. Um, I've had my shoulder dislocated. That is not a fun thing. That's a lot of pain. Uh, so for him to say that, uh, that's a bold statement. Uh, and if you ever had it, you understand what I'm talking about. It's never the same after that. For then, for uh, verse 22, then let my arm fall from my shoulder blade and my arm be broken from the bone. I think he sounded pretty confident that he didn't do all this stuff. For the destruction from God was a terror to me. And by reason of his, by reason of his highness, I could not endure. So he understands God's powerful. If I had made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my competence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great, and because my hand had gotten much. If I beheld the sun when it shineth, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart hath been secretly enticed, or my mouth has kissed my hand. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found me. Like I said, I'm not going to make many comments, but I do want to make a comment there. Let's read again. I want you to pick up things. It says, If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him. I've got to admit that that sometimes is a hard thing not to do. When you know that you have lived your life the best you knew how, and there's a certain individual that you have done everything in the world to try to make them feel good about themselves, put them in positions, uh, bragged on them every time they turned around, always went out of your way to talk to them, 
always trying to make them feel like that they were greater than what they really were. And then when you do one little thing that may not be anything at all, really, just minor little offense, or maybe said something that they took wrong, and then all of a sudden, uh, they turn against you with a vengeance, and they go making up lies about you. They try to turn people against you, um, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And they do it out in public. They do it in private. It's everywhere you look, you see it going on. It is hard. It is hard not to rejoice when something happens to them. Uh, I'll give you an example of another thing, and 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 ask the Lord help. Ask the Lord to forgive me on this, because I do think this, and I it probably is wrong. But on my way to the church where I pastor, it takes me about an hour and fifteen minutes. Some of those roads are on single, uh, uh, well, I guess it would be a double lane, a, a, a going and coming lane. But it, it's just regular road. And speed limits fluctuate from 35 miles an hour to 55 miles an hour. I'm a stickler at staying close to the speed limit. Now, I might go three to four miles over it, but I try never to go more than that. So normally I will set my uh, speedometer to whatever the mileage is, maybe a few miles faster. And I'll be going down the road, and it never fails. One of two things is going to happen. I don't. It, it's one thing to get frustrated on the one, uh, but this doesn't cause me to, to feel the way I do on the other. Uh, it, without fail going home, it seems like I've always got Mr. Slug to get in front of me somewhere down the line on them roads where you can't pass, and it's just that single lane. Uh, and it takes forever to get home then. But the one that really irritates me the most is I'm sitting here doing, uh, I'm doing 58, 59 in a 55 mile an hour zone, or, or you name the, the speed, 35, 45, whatever, three or four miles over that. And this, these, I call them idiots, I'll just say what, what I feel. These idiots come flying up behind me, wanting me to speed. Now on these roads I'm talking about, trust me, I know that there are police officers staked out, and I know where they're staked out. And so, therefore, I just don't want to take a chance. Now, when I get on the expressway, I go a little bit faster. But on these roads, I don't want to take a chance. I know these small-town cities, and I know where they're at. But they'll get right on my rear end, and then they'll pass on a double lane and sometimes around a curve going up a hill. That frustrates me to no end. Number one, it frustrates me because they're risking my life. If someone comes across that hill or 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 uh, comes across that, that road to where it's double-lined and, and, and I'm in the way, then I'm going to get hit by somebody. And so that alone frustrates me and, and gets me gets my uh, blood pressure rising. But they'll zip past me and they go flying down the road another 10, 20 miles, 10, 15, 20 miles over the speed limit. And without fail, most of the time I say, boy, I hope that cop's up there. I hope that cop's there to, li to give them a ticket. And slow them down. Now, my intentions are good because of the fact that, like I said, when you're flying like that, you're risking other people. If you want to do that on a drag strip and risk your own life, that's your business. But when you're doing it on the road, you're risking other people. But I'll make that statement. And, and I've told my wife, and I know it's wrong. Please forgive me as I, as I repent. I understand that we all have faults. But I've told my wife, boy, I... I look forward to the day when some nut like that that's doing 20 miles over the speed limit and pass me on a double line going over a hill like that, that that police officer be down there and I can pass by. And I said, and, and I don't care if it's the middle of winter. When I pass by, I'm going to raise down the window and I'm just going to give them a wave and smile as I pass by. Uh, so that's not hatred. I know it's not hatred, but it's a sense of pride and happiness and joy that someone else is going through a rough day. Uh, am I wrong for doing that? I'm wrong for thinking that. Regardless if my intentions are right, my wrong, um, I'm wrong in thinking that. Uh, but let's read that verse again and get back to, to where we're doing. You're trying to figure out some emotions and why he's saying what he's saying. And, and, and of course, on this, we've got to also understand, is he justifying himself? Uh, is he telling the truth while he's justifying himself according to what we know about Job? And all of that. So in verse 29, let's read it again. He said, If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him, neither 
Have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul? Now, just now I admitted that I kind of do that. Uh, not as bad, but I kind of do that. Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. I guess by me saying, I hope that police officer's up there is wishing a curse, not to his soul, but to his driver's record. If the men of my tabernacle said not, or that I had had his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveler. If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, did I fear the great multitude or did the contempt of families terrify me that if I kept silence and went not out of the door? Oh, that one would hear me. Listen to that. It's exclamation point. Pick that one out. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. Surely I would have taken it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare unto him the number of my steps. As a prince, would I go near unto him? If my land cry against me, or that the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I had eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life. Let's read it again. If I had eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life. Listen to what he said. Let thistles grow instead of wheat, and a cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Then Eluhi was offered uh, Eli, 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 he, he, I don't know why I'm having a problem tonight on that, was offended at Job's speech. Because of him, Job was justifying himself instead of justifying God. Do you feel like that Job had a right to justify himself? I feel like he did. These men have accused him uh, falsely and told all kinds of lies against him because they thought that surely this must have been something that Job had done and because of this, God is punishing them. So I think he had a right to, to justify himself. And why would he justify God? And he's saying, and if you would listen to them words, if you was listening to them words and trying to figure out something, I want you to go back and look and see if you did not see places where he was saying, look, if I had done this, God's just in what he's doing. That, that I, I'm not saying I, I would take it upon myself. If I've done it, then let God have, have his way with me. So there even he's, he's even frustrated here with Job, uh, and he hasn't even the right to do it there. Uh, from here to chapter 38, he gives his response. He was not only upset with Job, uh, but he was also upset with the other three men who had not accomplished in his eyes anything. In short, he condemns Job's friends and, and claims of being without sin. Uh, Job's claims of being without sin and declares God's justice in this and condemns Job's attitude towards God and exalts God's greatness. Now, what he did in essence was not all that wrong. Um, he was right in just about everything he said. And he had been the youngest one of the group. And had took. And another thing I found that was interesting, and there again we need to learn from this young man. He listened. A fool speaketh all that's in his heart. He listened. He listened to Job. He listened to the other guys, uh, their accusation. He listened to Job's answers and what Job had to say before he ever made a statement. Makes you wonder, was he praying in that time? Was he evaluating what he had learned through scriptures? Was he listening to the Holy Spirit at that time? Now, I know the Holy Spirit didn't indwell a person at that time, but uh, God's knowledge was, I'm sure, upon him. But uh, like I said, he, he, that's something we can learn. We, 
don't be quick to speak. Silence sometimes uh, can be very intimidating. For instance, if we stop just for, well, let's say we stop for 15 seconds. I'm going to put 15 seconds in silence just so you see how that is. So when we get down to this, That was 15 seconds. Now that 15 seconds felt a lot longer, didn't it? So sometimes when we're counseling people, uh, we want to fill in all the words. I do when I'm teaching class. It, it's awkward to have nothing to say. Maybe that's how come I uh, stutter a lot. Because you don't want a dead spot. In radio, they tell you, don't have a dead spot. You'll lose the audience. In preaching, you don't ever want to have a dead spot. But sometimes we just need to be quiet and, and just tell them, let me think on this just a minute. Just just give me a minute to think. Or tell them, let's think on that just a second. You take some time and think of what you said. I'll give you a for instance of how that helps. Uh, one time there was a, a preacher uh, that we knew, and he had always uh, had a sermon to preach, and if he didn't have one, he'd make one and make sure that it was done, whether God had let him or not. Uh, and that's what pastors do. I'm not going to say I hadn't done it in the past. I have. You gotta have something to give to the people you feel like you do. But on this one given Sunday, he gets up there and he said, you know what? He said, I could have come up with a sermon. He said, I normally do. And he said, but I want to hear from God. And I, I'm sorry when I've come up with sermons that God did not give me. And I just made up for myself so that I could have something to say. He said, so this morning, he said, I hope you can bear with me. He said, but I'm gonna sit down and I'm going to sit here and pray and wait for God. And until God speaks, I'm not saying a word. If you feel the need to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. But I'm not saying anything until I hear from God. And he sat down. Seconds became minutes. And minutes became multiple minutes. He sat there for 30 minutes in total silence. Church not saying nothing, just looking at him. Can you imagine sitting there for that long in a congregation waiting for it? Most people can't sit that long when the preacher is talking and giving a good sermon. Uh, our mind normally only comprehends up to about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And yet he sat there for 30 minutes. But what happened after that was amazing. God spoke to him. God seen that he meant business. And God gave him a sermon. And he got up and said, God has told me what to say this morning. And he began to tell exactly what God had told that church. Or God wanted that church to know. And buddy, that morning revival broke out in that church. And the church never was the same again. So sometimes we it does us harm if we continue to talk. And don't sit back and look and evaluate and listen to God. And try to figure out what what might need to be said at this certain time or that certain time. But one thing to take note as we end the study of his emotions of Job is that God stepped in and he gave uh, the option after Eli, uh, Elihu uh, gave option is a way, uh, uh, the only way, or God is the only way, excuse me, God is the only way that matters. It's also worth mentioning that as you read the rest of the chapters of Job and as I said, I, I hope you do that. Don't, don't let this go. That God rebuked the other three, but he had no rebuke for Elihu. El, That's so hard for me to say. For the most part, uh, he gave truth when he spoke. Now, like I said, I know we spent a long time reading all of what Job said. But as I said earlier, I believe it was important to do so since our topic is emotions. And God seemed to fit, uh, fit to put 42 chapters of this uh, in his emotions. And if God felt it necessary to write every one of Job's words, then I believe it's also ne necessary to read them as well. And as a matter of fact, Job is so profound that maybe one day, I, I think I mentioned this, we'll get a class up on just the book of Job uh, and dealing with his emotions and how, and how to counsel people uh, going through many of the things that Job was feeling. We can break it down uh, even more so, and then uh, take sections of, of a verse or whatever, find that emotion, and then see how we would have talked to Job. What would our response be to Job? I think that would be a good class. I think it would be a hard class to 
uh, put together, but it would be a good class. But as an assignment, again, please also take the time to not only read the rest of the book of Job, but look at what God said to Job and how he made Job answer a few things. But then in true form of God, God blessed Job for all that he endured with much more than Job would have ever imagined. And he also not only did that, but God was able through those blessings and through all that to shut the mouth of the enemies for Job's sake. Uh, that's another important point that we need to mention. Uh, we don't have to justify ourselves. We need to do like Job, and we just need to live our life in a holy manner, not allow our emotions to get in the way, not let pain and heartache and mistrust and all that affect us, but instead of moving on emotions, then stay strong in the Spirit of God and do what God says, regardless of how we feel about it. Feelings doesn't matter when it comes to serving God and obeying what God wants us to do. It does not matter. So I think it would do us good to do like Job and not try to vindicate ourselves so much, but let the Holy Spirit do the work. Uh, this one incident, I'll be honest with you, the reason I mentioned that about it's hard not to want to speak out, we had a situation in our church, and that person still today uh, will make comments on Facebook and other places, uh, maybe not calling out our name, but everyone knows the situation because they started off by telling it. And trying to down the church, trying to down us, and trying to make it look like we're wrong, and they don't even understand the whole situation or the story. Uh, and you want to speak back out. But let me tell you, if you don't speak out, if you don't let your emotions to go awry, and you just be faithful, then somewhere down the road, God will vindicate you, and he'll do what's necessary to shut the mouths of those that's talking. Now, I'd mentioned that there's another man that we'd like to go over in some of his depressions as well. And, of course, that man is Elijah. We're not going to do like we did in Job and, and pull out the verses. Like I said, from this standpoint on, we may get very little verses. Most of you know these stories. Can I tell you that I know that maybe some of you are recently converts or maybe didn't ever raise up in the church that uh, gave these stories and maybe you don't know about them, so... I would request that you would look them up online, the stories of where they're found, and then read it in the Bible yourself. Read the entire information about them. Go from first time when anything's written about them up to the end. But we won't go through these because most of us remember the stories, and we're just going to try to deal mainly with the emotions that we can find in them stories. So, when we read up uh, of Job's depression, we might understand that he got depressed considering he was a wealthy man. And knowing well in his community, he had a wonderful family, and yet everything was taken from him at one time. However, when we look at Elijah's life, it's a little harder to understand how he could get so depressed. Now, remember, it doesn't say that Job was any special man. Uh, doesn't seem like he had any kind of special powers or a special anointing. He was just a faithful servant of God, always trying to do what God would have him do as far as his own life and how to live his life. But now just to recap some of Elijah's top moments, he helped the widow and her son who were down and out, and remember only had enough food for one more meal. You remember that, right? He uh, he, he comes and he's hungry and he stops at this widow's house and, and had a l little child there. And he said, make me something to eat. And she said, well, we only have enough meal to make a meal. To, uh, me and him going to have just a little bit to eat and then we're going to die. We don't have anything else. And this is what he said, the boldness of Elijah. But he knew, God knew that God would come through. And he said, well, go ahead and do what you said, but make me something to eat first. In other words, Go ahead and cook your meal and die, but make sure I get something to eat first. Um, so he, he was able to do that. And sure enough, remember, uh, uh, they had plenty. They, they didn't run out of oil and meal. It was there. And then later on, when her son died, Elijah was used to perform a miracle to bring uh, the, the son back to life. Uh, and he also prayed for rain and uh, prayed for the rain, and it came uh came ending a drought. Remember, a drought came and a famine was in the land and 
he prayed for God to open up the doors of the rain. And he also actually called down fire from heaven. You remember that story, I'm sure. You know, it, it, all these other people serving all these other idols and stuff. And, and uh, they was cutting themselves and doing all these different things and to show whose God is God, the real God. And Elijah just said a few words, and here come the fire down. And so I'm sure with each and every mountaintop experience that Elijah had, uh, that he was full of different types of emotions. Uh, most likely he was filled with joy and contentment when Israel turned back to God. And I'm sure he was surprised when the fire came uh, down and, and in the rain as well as the child coming back from the dead. Uh, we may go back and look at some of uh, the other emotions Elijah had later on in, in these lessons uh, and that what he experienced. But right now, uh, because of what we went through with Job, we want to deal with the depression that he fell in. Like I said, it's kind of hard to imagine that he would fall into depression with all the things that God did for him that he's seen, that God moved upon. Uh, he helped cause the nation of Israel to turn back to, to God. He killed 850 pagan prophets and even outrun the king's chariot at one time. And then to top it off, uh, he was carried away to heaven in a chariot of fire. Uh, that being said, that's one of the reasons I mentioned that uh, this particular time uh, at our church, we're doing another class. I'm hoping it'll be able to be available for with Antioch, but we're teaching the end time events of Revelation. And uh, it talks about the two witnesses that's coming, and they will be slain in the street. Uh, and I believe Elijah is one of those, because to me, the Bible said that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. So all of us, besides, uh, all of us actually has to face death. But Elijah and Enoch didn't. Both of them were carried away. Eli uh, Elijah carried away with the chariot of fire, and then it just said that Enoch walked with God and was not. He just went with God. Uh, so it's appointed unto man once to die, and I believe that these two men have to come back and uh, go ahead and die. Uh, and of course, they'll be dying for their faith. And although Elijah had many major accomplishments, though, uh, he still fell into depression. And this should be a warning to all of us, no matter who we are or what we've accomplished. We are all subject to fall into depression. As a matter of fact, we're subject to fall in anything, even blatant, rotten sin. We're subject to to fall into that. We don't ever need to feel so self-confident in ourselves and so prideful that we think we can't fall where other people have fallen. That's why it's important that we don't judge other people. And it's interesting also to note as well, although God did some miraculous things right before he spoke to Elijah during his depression, none of those phenomenal things moved Elijah out of his depression. You remember, it, it was all kinds of things. He he sent a strong wind and all these different things, these uh, earthly phenomenon things that, that would just tear anyone out of their frame and open their eyes. But Elijah stayed slooped over and just depressed. Uh, actually, when he finally heard God, it was a still, small voice. That was what was in the wind. But he was trying to wake up, trying to wake up Elijah. And when a person is depressed, everything is gloom and gray. I've lived that before. I, I've been in a place in my life that I was so depressed, and a matter of fact, I attempted suicide, I'll be honest with you. So I know what depression is, and I know where it, what it's like to not have to feel, feel like there's no hope and to, to feel no joy, uh, no aspiration whatsoever wanting to live. So I know that. And during that time, it's literally gray. It could be a beautiful blue sky day. But in your eyes, your mind is perceiving a greatness, a gloominess. Uh, they can't see the miracle of life or the joys of living at that particular time, no matter how great it may be. Robin Williams was a good example of that. Robin Williams had a, a wife that loved him. He had a career that was beyond belief, and everyone loved him, and he just laughed. But there was something in Robin that was very uh, desperate need and causing him a, a, a great depression. And no matter that he had money, no matter that he had fame, no matter that he had people that loved him and people that wanted him being around, and no matter it seemed like that nothing would, should have been bothering him, yet it didn't matter. He could not see that. And that's why it's very hard to deal with people 
who are depressed. And that's why we're taking some extra time on depression because it's very serious. We're going to see it later on, hopefully in this lesson, if not the first or next, and we may have to go into the next lesson with it. But we're going to go over some of this of why uh, we're going over depression and why it's so important. And many times it needs to be uh, left up to a professional. Uh, that's like I was saying to start with, we can't just think that we can control everyone through the Bible. Some people won't accept the Bible. Some people are not willing to listen to anyone. Some people has chemical imbalances in their body and may need to talk to a professional. And we need to know at what point we need to say, look, I think you need to go to a different source of help and not just try to help them all ourselves uh, because that could lead into a desperate move. I've had to do that. I've had to tell people, look, your, your situation is beyond what I can do. You're not willing to listen. You're not willing to listen to what the Bible says about it. So therefore, uh, you need to talk to a talk to a psychiatrist, and and we'll give you some information so that you can go to someone who knows how to handle this, and may have to put you on some sort of prescription to help you along with this. But we'll go ahead and read some of the story of of the uh, the light depression of what God, of what God did. Uh, it's found in First Kings. So get your Bible, turn to First Kings. And turn to chapter 19. Give you a little bit of time to get there. They always say to repeat it three times is a good rule to follow when you're going to preach a sermon. So we'll do it again. First Kings chapter 19. So if you're at First Kings chapter 19, we're going to start with verse 5. The Bible says, And as he lay and slept under a jennifer tree, behold, there an, they, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. So he wasn't doing nothing. When you're depressed, you don't feel like eating. You don't, you don't feel like doing anything. You don't even want to get out of bed. That's a sign of that depression. You don't want have no aspirations to do anything. And then it says in verse 6, And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water, at his head, and he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. Now let me ask you a question. If you was depressed, and you've done run out into the desert, there's no one around. You've not had anything to eat, you're just sleeping because you're so depressed. And then all of a sudden an angel wakes you up and says, look here, I've got you something here to eat. I've baked you something to eat. And I've got you some cool water to drink. Would that not get you out of your depression just a little bit? To know that God Almighty has sent an angel. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I believe this is a, a type of Christ. Uh, mainly because of what the next verse calls this angel. Uh, but that Christ himself would come and bake you something to eat and give you something to drink to try to get you out of the position that you're in. Uh, he's done that. He's done that to many of us, and we still don't understand it. Uh, Christ came to set us free from our sin. That alone should keep us happy to where we shouldn't get depressed. And he kept us from having to go to hell there again. That alone should keep us to where we wouldn't get depressed or upset or, or feel like a failure. But there again, we are human beings, and we fail, and this is where Elijah is. Then in verse 7, the reason I think it's a, a type of Christ Christology, it says, then the angel of the Lord came again. So it's not the first time this, this angel was coming. Uh, it was, must have been the very same angel that came back and he's called the angel of the Lord. Now, when it says the angel of the Lord, uh, that, that normally represents Jesus Christ. It said he came a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Do you see how much God uh, Jesus Christ cares about you when you're in times to where you don't feel like you can do anything, when your emotions has torn you to sunder to where you can't see the, the, the dawning of a new day. Can you see how much he loved him to take out his time to go to one individual that was out in the desert and cook him a meal, not once, 
but cooked it twice and made sure that he had what he needed so that he could go on his journey. Can I tell you just by reading those verses, although you may be in a depressed state, although you may not see anything that's worth living for, God has a plan in your life and God will make sure that you have what you need to finish your race. So us as having the word of God and understand this, Elijah didn't have all these different stories. He didn't understand a lot of this stuff, but we have these stories. We know we can draw from it. Not only do we have the Bible, but we have the Holy Spirit that lives with inside of us. So for us, although we may be human and although we're full of emotions, uh, for us, it should be a little bit more difficult for us to get upset if we're truly walking in the Spirit, if we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he will meet all of our needs. But there again, we fall in this situation. So twice now, Jesus Christ himself has come to Elijah, made him a meal, gave him something to drink, and he knew that he was going to have to get him out of that situation. You've got to move from where you are. You can't stay in a place of depression. You've got to get out of it. If you stay there, sure enough, life is going to end for you, and you will never be able to accomplish what God's called you to do. And I know that for a fact. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and finish it. I told you that, that I myself had tried, uh, tried to commit suicide, and it was because of the fact that something had in my life uh, that I didn't feel like that I'd ever be able to minister again. Now, for, for a preacher, the Bible says that, that, that we have a fire that's in our bones that cannot be quenched. Uh, we have to preach. Uh, it, that's how come people say all the time when, they, when a, pre, uh, a new preacher or whatever say, well, I think I'll do something else. Uh, one preacher said the best advice to give him say, well, go ahead. If you can do something else, do it. Because if you're a true preacher, you can't do anything else. That's your life. And so this situation happened. I was young. I was stupid. And uh, and I was so depressed, and I was hurt by the situation, and I didn't know what to do. And uh, so I called around, and I asked some people, and, and they told me, they said, well, you know, it might be best you just go ahead and commit suicide. And that's exactly what I tried to do. And as I was, what I felt was dying, I could see death coming over my eyes. I heard a voice whom I believe was Satan, and I and that voice laughed, and he said, I got you. You'll never accomplish what God has caused, called you to do. And I had just enough strength. I was living with my dad at the time. I had just enough strength to get to his door, and I kind of hit the door as I collapsed down and Thank God he was awake. That was all providential of God because he is already in the bedroom. He opened the door, seen where I was at. Uh, he picked me up. He rushed me down to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, uh, the doctors uh, did all they could. They come out and they told dad, they said, he's got, he, he said, we got bad, bad news and worse news. He said, what's, what do you want to hear? Dad said, well, what's the worst news? And he said, well, the worst news is that all the pills that he took are gone. And he said he took a bunch and said, uh, chances are he's not going to make it out alive. And uh, he said, good gracious. He said, well, what's the one that's, that's bad news then? He said, well, if he does make it out alive, he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. He'll never walk again. He'll never talk again. Uh, so just be prepared to take care of him. But you know what? Uh, my dad sat there and said, I appreciate that. He said, but I need someone else to talk to for a second opinion. Is there a, a monastery or a place where I can go pray here? And uh, he showed him where the chapel was, and daddy went and talked to the great physician. Bottom line, I come out that night walking and talking. Now, the problem is, is I don't have a memory much anymore. I can't even remember Amazing Grace. I, and, and when I study through my courses in college or when I prepare lessons, I have to have notes there, and I have to keep going back on them notes because I can't remember that stuff. But I'm grateful that I'm alive and that I'm talking, and, I, and, I, and I've had something to do. That My entire life I've had something to do to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I often sing, and i got a very loud voice, a very strong voice that God gave me, and I always tell people that's my witness all this time that Satan is a liar and he's the father of it. And therefore I love singing in order to say, look, what God can do. So here Elijah's in this depressed state and God knew his mission that he wanted for Elijah and he sent his son to sit there and build him up to give him the strength because he is our, our guide. He is our path. He is the light to our path. He is the one that guides our steps 
And he knew this wasn't the end for Elijah and that Elijah needed to come out of his, his depression and uh, his self-loathing. Uh, he needed to get out of those kind of emo emotions that's keeping him down, the fear, uh, the anxieties that he had. Uh, he needed to shake him out of those emotions. And so in verse 8 he said, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mouth of God. Now, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have some meat cooked by Jesus Christ uh, if it would last you for 40 days and 40 nights? Uh, that must have been one amazing meal, uh, full of energy and, and vitamins and everything that the body would need. Who else could cook a meal like that than Jesus Christ? Uh, so he, he's, he's, I'm sure he's still walking depressed. I'm sure he's walking all the way with his head down thinking, oh, I don't want to go this. I don't want to go any further. Sometimes in life we get that way. Our emotions get us down. And uh, especially if you're a pastor, uh, you, you, you get to a point sometimes, oh, I really don't want to face these people today. They've been bickering all week long, and I don't really have anything good to tell them. God give me a message that's not going to be very encouraging. I just don't want to face this. Or even worse, having to go into a board meeting knowing that they're not up, that they're not happy with everything that's been going on. But God is in control, and Jesus Christ will give you what you need. So don't let them emotions keep you down. Then in verse 9, he said, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. So he's found another place to get back in the bed and wrap up with and say, Oh, woe is me. My life is over. And you remember why he's doing this, right? You do remember that after all these uh, prophets had died, and uh, actually they were servants of Jezebel, and uh, after all these people died and Jezebel lost all these people, she said, I'm going to go kill him. And he had done all these miracles through Jesus, uh, through the power of, of God, and yet he, he was afraid of this one woman. And so he's taking off running, and he's sitting there saying, God, just kill me. I'm the only one left here. I, no one else is serving you. Well, and as the old saying said, but if he really wanted to know I had to do is stay there because Jezebel was going to make sure that she killed him. He didn't want to die. He, he was just depressed. He, 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 he was sad. He, maybe he had a little bit of, um, uh, his pride might have been hit a little bit. Maybe he's a little bit embarrassed. Who knows? But I'm, I'm sure he's full of all these negative emotions. Uh, but if he wanted to die, uh, he didn't have to go anywhere. So that's why he's in this state of mind to begin with. And yet he comes to this cave after having two meals fit, fixed by the Lord and, and water provided for him. And then having the power and the strength to keep going on a journey, get further away from this woman, uh, he still hadn't come out of that depression. Uh, like I said, depression is a hard thing. Uh, once a person's in that state of mind, it is hard to get them out of that. And so here he is, uh, found himself into a cave, and he lodged there. No way, he's there. he made his dwelling there. He, he's just going to be in a cold, dark, damp cave and singing, Woe is me, woe is me. It says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Yeah, God ever asked you that question? What, what are you doing? Why, why are you just hanging around not doing what he's called you to do? Why are you feeling so, uh, uh, feeling so sad and, and feeling so worthless and feeling like you can't accomplish nothing? And he said, Listen at him. Listen at him. Listen to his pride. Listen. Listen to his self-pity, his woes, his, his anguish. And I'm not trying to make light of it. When a person's going through that, it is hard. And this is how he's feeling. But you've got to remember, this man was a miracle man. I mean, a miracle man. Uh, in so much that Elisha wanted double portion of what he had. So he was a powerful, powerful man of God. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Now, and, and what he's saying is, remember, He's talking to a God who has all knowledge. He knows the beginning from the end. So God has looked at his life. God knew how much zealous that he had for him and how much work that he had done for him. And yet he's sitting there telling God something that he thinks God doesn't know. So I've been zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And listen to this. And I, even I only, am left. <laughs> there is no one else that has served you, God, but me. 
I have worked so hard all my life. That's self-pity. And we get that way sometimes. Sometimes we want people to just pat us on the back. Good job, good job. And no one been patting Elijah on the back. And says, and they seek my life to take it away. Well, like I said, he said he wanted to die. And he said, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. And so it says, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great, and this, these are the events we just talked about. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break into pieces the rocks before the Lord. Can you imagine what that sight must have looked like? Here you are in the cleft of a mountain. So obviously he was right beside this mountain. And a wind so strong that it literally broke the mountain and rocks into pieces. Now we've, I've seen some severe tornadoes. I used, to, I used to fly. I still got my pilot license. I had a little small plane. And uh, uh, one time a tornado had come through and it was an F4. And so I got in my plane that next day and and I, I flew over the area where that hit. And I'm talking about, it looked like for miles there was nothing. But that's just houses. It was around the mountain too, but it didn't destroy the mountain. It destroyed some trees and stuff, but it didn't destroy that mountain. So this had to be one powerful, strong wind. Now, I believe if I seen that, that probably would have woke me up from my depression. I, I, as a matter of fact, it probably went to depression, to fear and dread and regret. I mean, all kinds of emotions probably would have replaced that depression, uh, but evidently it didn't, it didn't phase Elijah much. And said, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. So it gotten worse. Now, now it's not just this wind moving, but the earth is literally shaking. And, and then my thought would be, Lord God going to kill me right here. He's going to, uh, this is what he brought me in here for. He's going to let all these rocks fall down and crush me. Said, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. Now we're really getting serious because the fire sucks out all your oxygen. And if that fire gets to you, you have no place to go. You're stuck into that cave. And if fire gets right to that cave, it's going to suck all the oxygen out. said, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire, the Bible says, a still, small voice. And it was so. When Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? He asked him again, What are you doing here? He had a purpose. He had a purpose. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thy nostrils, and slain thy prophets with sword, and I, even I, only left to seek in my life and take it away. Then the Lord uh, once again used Elijah. Notice that God didn't say a single word to him. Listen what he said in verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. So he didn't console him. He didn't say, boy." Elijah, he didn't say, Elijah, I appreciate all that you've done for me. Uh, he didn't do anything. He just told him, he said, I want you to go back in the wilderness. Go back to Damascus, out in that wilderness. That's, that's your journey. I got you here. I want to tell you a few things. It took all this to wake you up a little bit. Uh, but I want you to go back to the wilderness. How, how much would that have helped a person in depression, do you think? Uh, I don't know how much it would have helped me. I believe seeing all that stuff might have helped me a good bit. But I don't know how much it would have helped as far as just Saying, go back in the wilderness. <laughs> and, and when thou comest, anoint Hoseal to be king over Syria. So now he's telling him, not only do I want you to go in the wilderness, but I got something I want you to do. Now, I've heard you complain. I've heard you, I heard you moan and groan. I've heard you tell me how cruel life is and how, how great you are. But I, I got a work for you to do. Uh, I want you to anoint this king over Syria. Now, that sounds almost cold hearted. But if you look closely into that verse, he gave him instruction to do a job. One of the best ways, if you're depressed, if you feel like that you are down and out and you feel like the world's against you and nothing goes right in your life, one of the best things somebody can do normally 
is to be able to go someplace like, uh, for instance, a, a, a shelter for the homeless and feed those homeless people and sit down and listen to their stories and give them comfort, give them some cover, give them some food. Watch how they appreciate that. And by having something to do for someone else, that can get your attention off yourself and onto someone else. If, if you think that your life is bad, go to an old folks' home and, uh, and, and talk to those people. Some of them people hadn't seen their loved ones for years and, and just sitting there being put over there to die. And the staff don't care nothing about them. So God, it may in a, in a way be trying to help Elijah pull him out of his depressed and self-centered state uh, by giving him a job to do. When you have a job, do your minds focus on something else. And said, Jehu, Je Jehu, the son of Nimshah, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. So he gave him another task. And Elijah, the son of Saphat, of Abelmanel, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hezekiah shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And then he goes ahead and lets him know. Buddy, I heard you. I got you a job to do. You need to anoint these people. They're going to take over. They're going to take, take some of this battle. They're going to win these different things because I'm behind him. And then he gives them some encouragement and uh, lets him know that he's not alone. He said, yet. I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So God may have allowed Elijah to run his mouth. He may have allowed Elijah to sulk and have self-pity. We don't know how long he had done it. We know that the journey alone was 40 days and 40 nights, so we know that for over a month, that, uh, that Elijah was in this depressed state, not wanting to do anything and no longer doing any work for the Lord. Uh, but then God gives him assignment. And all this while, he's feeling like no one's been here. I'm the only one been fighting this battle. Can I tell you that life does get hard and there are times to when it's going to seem like that there is no one that's been out there. There is no one that has done anything for God. But... That's not the case. Um, they, there's, there's people that serve in God, especially when we get in, now into this, this end times. Uh, man, when you look on the news, when you look on Facebook and uh, any other kind of source you see, it just seems like it's evil. And people don't talk about God. They act like they hate God. And you go to churches and there are very few people there. The ones that are there seem like they're not really doing much for God. So sometimes you can feel like you're alone. But God has a remnant. He always has a remnant. Even in, the, in, in Revelation, it shows that God has a remnant of people, that God is going to have some people that serves him. And so Satan's job is to come along and try to discourage us, try to make us feel like we're alone, and make us feel lonely, make us feel depressed, make us feel like that we have no worth, make us feel like we're not accomplishing anything, tries to get us into depression, try to get us hopeless, and gives us all these negative emotions. But we need to remember that we're not alone, that there's millions of people on this earth. There are people in other countries right now, and, and we've got it good in America. We may, we may have to go through some people talking bad about us or whatever and hurt our little feelings and mess with our emotions. Son. But there's people in China and places like that that, they're dying for their faith. They are being persecuted for their faith. What in the world are we going to do if it ever gets to that point? If we can't handle a little bit of, of, of negative talk towards us, if our emotion gets us to such a point that we don't want to serve God anymore because someone says something bad about us or someone kicked us out of our position in church or whatever. Uh, so I was glad that God's, God told him, he said, look, i got these 7,000 men. They've never bowed. They're still doing their work. You need to do your work. Uh, so in this passage, though, on Elijah, we see several symptoms of depression uh, that affect so many people, especially people in recovery. Um, you see, for instance, you see a, a, 
a sense of help, hopelessness and worthlessness. Once you're there, you can't, you don't have a vision anymore. The Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. So if you if you get to where your emotions has got you completely hopeless and worthless, uh, then you, if something doesn't change, you're washed up. You've got to get out of that. Uh, you've got to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it gives you despair and, and thoughts of ending your life. Uh, another thing that it does is isolate, it lights you from others. And uh, I know that mainly this course deals with uh, with the emotions of people in the Bible. However, I think uh, we'll go ahead and explain a little bit more about depression uh, since it is such a major problem and one of the most dangerous emotions that a person can face. So I don't know how much we're going to get into that this time, but I do I do want you to write down. I think it would be uh, important for you to write down what we just now said. So let's go back over that just a little bit. And uh, it may or may not show up later, but I think it's good that you have it down so that you know what it brings. Uh, so uh, we see several symptoms. Uh, and I, like I said, I'll read this slowly. And I think it'd be good if you write it down. But we see uh, several symptoms of depression. And if we can't get to the rest of that, then we'll start off with our next lesson on uh, these other points that I wanted to give uh, as far as depression. So several symptoms of depression that affect so many people is a sense of hopelessness and worthlessness. A sense of hopelessness and worthlessness. There's also despair and the thoughts of ending one's life. Again, despair and thoughts of ending one's life. And finally, isolation from others. Isolation from others. When you when you look at that last one, my first thing that come to my mind, and, and we may have mentioned it before in, in the course, but it's always good to go back over it. What did Satan do when he tried to get Jesus to not finish his task here on earth? Well, we know one thing that he did. He carried him into a desert. Carried him into a wilderness area. Why would he do that? Why would Satan carry him to a place like that? Well, the obvious reason is, is because he wanted to isolate himself from everyone else. What happens when you're isolated from other people? The problem is, is when you become separated from other people, is you don't have anyone else to lean on. The problem with an individual when they begin to go through depression or go through a time of molting and, and uh, feeling like they're worthless, um, a lot of times they unintentionally maybe begins to move away from family and friends. They don't want to talk to them. They don't want to hear what they got to say. Uh, maybe it's because of embarrassment. Maybe because it's a sense of pride. Maybe it's because of some regret that they've had. Uh, maybe it's because they know they did something to someone and they don't want to face it. Uh, there could be a ton of reasons. But it seemed like one of the common things is people begin to isolate themselves from others. When God created man, the Bible says, and he saw man, that it was not good that man be alone. We are created beings by God, and we're made into a position to where we need one another. We need to lean on others. The reason it's important to have people and not get isolated, the reason it's important to have people around you is because time and chance happens to everyone. And the thing that you need to remember if you get into a place to where you just feel burnt out and you, you don't want to go anymore and you just want to get away from it all, don't get away from everybody. Always have someone there that you can count on, someone that you can 
depend on. Because what happens is, is if you've got a dear friend, one that you can share emotions with and struggles with and even sin with, and that you know that what you tell them is not going to go anywhere else, that your secrets are safe with them, that they will pray with you, that they will encourage you, that they will hold you accountable to keep you from continuing onto a road of destruction. What happens is, is that when you're there in that time to where you need them, then they're going to be there to, to, to be able to see the other side. Because when you're in a depressed state or, or in anguish, you get tunnel vision. All you see is the problem. All you see is that uh, that things are hurting and, and it's, it's hard for you to walk through and it's dark and it's dreary and gloomy. But when someone is not having to deal with the circumstance, they can see the outer perimeters and they can see maybe why you're going through certain things and be able to advise you on some things to help you through that. But they will have strength because they're not going through this. And so, therefore, uh, their, their words and, and their outlook on it is very important. And, and you need someone, if nothing else, you need someone there just to vent, just to get these emotions off you. Because if you take these emotions and you keep piling them on and piling them on, they'll eventually crush you. So it's important that we don't get away and we don't get isolated. The Bible said that Satan's job is to kill, steal, and destroy. He's like a lion coming after a prey. And what does a lion do? Again, the lion will search out a person who's weak, a person that, uh, 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 well, of course, a lion's not searching out a person, but he, he searches out an animal that is weak or, and, and not doing very well and tries to get them away from the herd because he knows the herd will protect them. And so once he gets them away from that, then he gets pounced in the attack and he begins to just to devour them. And that's what Satan wants to do with us. So he sees us when we're weak and he begins to try to draw us away from the rest of the people because he knows that there's power. The Bible says, if any two or three touch upon anything and agree, it shall be done. So there's power in numbers. And another reason why it's important also is not only so that you can yourself uh, be able to get strength. And at that time, that's what you need to be doing is get strength from these people, get guidance, get wisdom, get some direction in your life and allow God to speak through them to you. Unlike Joe's friends, hopefully that it's someone that will pray and understand what God's saying. But one day uh, you're going to come out of that. You're going to come to the other side. You're going to see the end of the tunnel and you're going to be ready to go back into the field and help other people. And normally as, as it will happen, time and chance, like I said, happens to everyone. So you're so grateful for this other individual and that you didn't, that they didn't leave you in the time of all this, but they were there for you. And so with time and chance, like I said, it happens with everyone. So eventually there may come a time to when that person, the one that you depended on, the one that helped you through the dark times of your life and when your emotions were not showing you anything but, but heartaches and pain. And they may come a time to when they find themselves there and now that they've helped build you up in times past, then now here you are. You're able to do exactly what they did for you. You're able to give them encouragement. You're being able to be the one that sees past the things they're going through and can see uh, and hear from God a little bit better. Remember, Elijah couldn't even hear from God all that much. All he could do is get up and eat, get up and eat. Didn't even realize his provisions was being made for him. But if you're not going through that at that particular time, then you can hear from the Lord a little bit better for them. You can help intercede with them in prayer. You can give them encouragement. You can tell them what the Lord Jesus said, and you can give them an ear to speak to. So that's why it's important you don't ever want to isolate yourself from. So I hope you got those notes down. Uh, if I can remember, you probably see it again. Uh, the question is, will I remember it? But at least you've got it written down. And like I said, the beginning of the next week, uh, we'll probably go ahead and talk a little bit more about depression, uh, how it affects people, and then we'll find another character and uh, uh, go a little bit further as far as the different characters and emotions that we find in the Bible. So I hope this hasn't been too boring for you. Hope you learned something. And let's have a word of prayer. We'll go ahead and be dismissed. Look forward to seeing you on uh, Lesson 14. Uh, we've only got three more to go. 
Uh, that last week, we're probably just going to hit some highlights of some things and uh, give you time to take your final exam. Uh, we'll just have to see how that works. and Hopefully, that's the way uh, we can get this thing to finish out. So let's have a word of prayer. We be dismissed. Father, thank you once again for coming into your throne. Thank you once again for allowing us to have another lesson. Thank you, Father, for your word that shows us all these, these people's emotions. And thank you that it doesn't only show the emotion, but it finds it. It shows the answers if we'll listen. God, I pray you'll continue to give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding on how to help people, whether we be in counseling, whether we be in preaching, or just witnessing to people. God, let us always be there for one another. Let us always be with people and not isolate ourselves from them. And God, let us always be willing to hear you and understand that we're not fighting this alone. God, thank you for what you've done to today and all the blessings you've given us. I just pray you'll keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us again. Hope to see you next week.